welcome to Istanbul, where I have just woken up in my bedroom at the Pera Palace Hotel with something a little bit unusual in my room. Now, this is a sight that I don't usually see in the morning. Good morning, Stephanie. Good morning, Oliver Strong. How are you? Do you know, I'm really, really good. I'm excited about today. I'm excited about breakfast. Yes, not bad. Not bad. It's within easy reach is how I describe this breakfast. You might wonder why we've got this little setup here. Great though the setup is. And for those of you who watch the Chateau Diaries, you may know that I got a 200,000 euro heating bill for the Chateau. That is to install heating, by the way. That's not running the heating for the winter. It wasn't that bad. Um, so Ollie and I are now saving money and sharing twin rooms on our travels. With Camilla and Philip's blessings, I, I must add. We were very concerned as to whether anyone was going to be snor snoring or not. And obviously, because Stephanie's a lady, she doesn't snore. So no, the main it's worry not, never. was about me. And it turns out we're okay. I mean, some sort of quite enthusiastic breathing. <laughs> yes, there was. But essentially, we both managed to sleep. So we could do this again. I think so. I slept like a log also. I wasn't expecting such a beautiful sight first thing in the morning. May I say how magnificent your pyjamas are? I know these are... Spanish pyjamas, the finest cotton from my favourite ever shop in Barcelona, which Stephanie, when I take you to Barcelona, I will show you. Yes. So what's the plan for today, Ollie? Well, as a bit of a history buff, I'm going to take you on a tour. And it's going to be the tour of the three ages of Istanbul. Oh, Oliver. I know, nice. I know, I know. I'm spoiling you. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, we're going to look at when it was the capital of the Byzantine Empire, the Roman times. And then we're going to look at it when it was the capital of the Ottoman Empire from 1453 onwards. And then we're going to finish by looking at when it was the part of the modern Turkish Republic. By the way, it has changed its name, the city, over time. So at the beginning, it was called Byzantium. I think that's my favourite. It's I just know, so it's romantic. Lovely. And that was named after Byzos, who was a Greek prince. Then it became Constantinople, named, of course, after the Emperor Constantine, the Roman Emperor. And then, obviously, more recently, it's been called Istanbul. And the name Istanbul actually comes from Istanbulin in Old Greek, which basically means into town. So it's just shorthand that people use saying, let's go into town. And eventually it stuck and then it became the official name. And no way, Istanbul means let's go into town. Absolutely, into town. yes. Well, let's go into and, town. And get your walking shoes on, Stokely. This no. city is absolutely vast. Officially, it has around 16 million people, but the locals say it has 20 and it definitely feels like 20. It's very crowded and very, very big. Well, I'm going to need more strength. We do have toast. We do. Oh, this looks very good. What I love about Istanbul is the fact we have two civilizations coming together. So we've got the Roman civilization and then we've got the Ottoman civilization from 1453. But when people think of Istanbul, most people don't think of a Roman city. But this was literally one of the two major Roman cities of its time. In the third century, Rome was going through a very, very tricky time. The Roman Empire was vast and it was getting out of control. So an emperor came along called Diocletian and he decided he was going to split the empire into two. So we had the western side, which we're so familiar with, and then we had the eastern side and the capital of the eastern side was Byzantium. So this was a Greek trading city, quite small at the time, named after the Greek prince Byzos. So not particularly significant until the Romans got here. And by the way, Diocletian decided to change the capital of the western part of the empire from Rome to a city much closer to the middle line between the two halves. And that city became known as Mediolanum, which of course today is Milan. So if you're wondering why Milan's called Milan, that's why. Okay, my mind is blown. I had no idea. So what Diocletian did in 285 was split the empire, but more than that, he created something called the Tetrarchy. So each side had two rulers. So there were four rulers of the Roman Empire in, in total. It worked pretty well in terms of stabilising things while he was alive. After that, there was absolute chaos. Everyone was fighting everyone until a guy came along called Constantine. Now, Constantine fought huge battles across the Roman Empire and actually reunited Rome as well. And he was interesting for more than his fighting for two reasons. First of all, he converted to Christianity, which was a big deal because it was a fairly new religion at the time, if you think about it. And secondly, he decided to make the capital of the entire Roman Empire here. He wanted to make it in what was called Byzantium and then renamed after him as Constantinople. And I want to show you this column, Stephanie. It's a lovely column, Oliver. Thank you for showing me this lovely column. So have you noticed, if you come round here, look, 
Come round here. And we're off. This was where the Roman Hippodrome was. So essentially the Formula One track of its day, but chariot racing instead. So it's difficult to think of it now, but actually under these roads here is the remains of the seating for the stadium. Oh, to go back in yeah. time and see that. 100,000 spectators would be here. This is 32 meters long. This was incredibly epic. And he really wanted to make a mark and show that this city was the new Rome. So here we have this obelisk, which marked the end of the track. This is actually 32 feet long, which was the same as the obelisk in the Circus Maximus in Rome. So he was making a real statement here. This was a city on a par with the greatness that was Rome. Now, this doesn't look that impressive next to the, let's face it, absolutely enormous obelisks on either side, but it would have been quite extraordinary in its day. It's three serpents twisting around each other and their heads, sadly, are now missing. But the extraordinary thing about it is that it was made out of the spoils of war. The Greeks defeated the Persians who were trying to invade them and they took many, many spoils of war and melted them all down and then they fashioned this column from it. So it's really a symbol of attack us and we will simply melt down all of your belongings and make pretty things to look out with them. And this was brought here by Constantine and used to decorate the Hippodrome. And this is my absolute favourite one. You have a favourite obelisk, of course you do. Yes. Who doesn't have a favourite Because this obelisk? one, the base of, has actual pictures of the chariot race in Happing. Ah, uh, yes, the base is excellent. Yes. And the rest is extremely Egyptian, Oliver. What is it doing in Istanbul? This was another spoil of war, of course. The Romans were also the rulers of Egypt as well, hence this Egyptian column. So look at this. So the top is Egyptian, but the bottom is my favourite bit where we can see pictures of the chariot race. And come look at this. Oh, yes! Oh, there are all see, the horses and the chariots! you see the horses? It's like quite some race, doesn't it? Look, I think that one's fallen off. Oh, that's fabulous! Isn't it amazing to think that we are standing in the middle of the Hippodrome and 17, 1800 years ago, there would have been the red team, the blue team, the green team and the yellow team whizzing round and we would have had 100,000 Romans shouting next to us and we never think of this place as a Roman city. So all around Istanbul are signs of this Roman past. And nowadays we call it the Byzantine Empire because obviously when the Romans took over the city, it was called Byzantium. But they never thought of themselves as Byzantines. They always thought of themselves as Romans. So actually they spoke Greek, not Latin, but they viewed themselves as being the same people as lived in Rome. They were all part of that empire. So if you went to someone and said Byzantine back in the fifth and sixth century, they wouldn't really know what you were talking about. They were purely Romans. There are signs of Rome wherever you go in Istanbul. So in this street is one of my favorites. This is the column of Constantine. So when he founded this city, he decided to take this column from Rome, where it had been in the Temple of Apollo and had Apollo, a statue of Apollo at the top of it. He decided to bring it all the way to Constantinople, put it in the middle of a magnificent round forum and put a statue of himself at the top. So it was him and not Apollo anymore. Absolutely, absolutely. So wherever you go in Istanbul, whether you see the, the Valens aqueduct that used to bring water in, whether you see the amazing walls of Theodosius, which protected the city for over a thousand years, were only breached twice, first by the Venetians in the Fourth Crusade at the beginning of the 13th century, and then finally by Mehmet the Conqueror in 1453, when the Byzantine Empire came to an end. There are Roman remains everywhere. It's such a fascinating, multifaceted, multi-layered city. It's absolutely incredible. The closer you look, you see a tiny bit of stone somewhere and there'll be some incredible story behind it. So Constantine is associated with Istanbul, of course, because of the name Constantinople and starting it as the Roman city. But the emperor who really took things to a whole new level was Justinian. And he rose from being a peasant to being the emperor and building this gives all of us hope. The Hagia Sophia, one of the most famous buildings in the world. And I'm so excited to go and see this again. I haven't seen this for about 20 years. Let's go. It's an amazing study. That's Byzantine up there. So here we are in the Hagia Sophia and it is breathtaking. 
This is 55 meters high, apparently, and that dome is 30 meters in width. It's the second time the dome was built because there was an earthquake in 558 and thing collapsed, but they soon rebuilt it again. It's amazing because when you see all these sort of uh, Islamic scripts and so forth around here, this does feel very much like a mosque. But for the majority of its life, it was actually a Christian church. So Justinian was Christian. This was a Greek Orthodox church. And it stayed that way from the 6th century right up until 1453 with the invasion of Constantinople by Mehmet the Conqueror. His troops came into here. Apparently priests were actually massacred in front of the altar whilst praying. A time of huge shock. And then after that, the sultans turned this, of course, into a mosque. And it remained a mosque for many, many years, right from 1453 until the very beginning of the 20th century. At the beginning of the 20th century, after the First World War, Ataturk, when he proclaimed the Turkish Republic, actually decided that it would be a good thing, because he was very much into secularism, to turn the Hagia Sophia into a museum. So it was a museum that people from all religions could come to. There was no religious worship here at all. It was only very recently, just a few years ago, that it was turned back into a mosque, which was quite a controversial decision at the time um, because of the fact it had just been a symbol of Turkish secularism. So now, if you can see down here, I have a hole in my feet, but because we're in a mosque, yeah, I have a hole in my sock, should I say, because we're in a mosque. Can't take we, you anywhere, Oliver. Because we're in a mosque, we need to take off our, our shoes. And Stephanie is, of course, wearing a, a scarf on her head as well. So this has been a real change. And this was a much debated change in Turkish society. Um, and there are all sorts of sort of political, religious reasons behind this, which we won't go into now. But it's just interesting that last time I came here, it was a museum. And now it's back to being a mosque again. And me too. This is the first time I've seen it as a mosque but it has been kept as welcoming as possible. Because it's not a museum, nobody needs to pay to enter anymore, and everybody is welcome. You do not have to be Muslim to come and visit. Simply need to take your shoes off to show respect, and everything is open to you. Yes, it definitely has that Turkish hospitality. What's incredible about coming into the Hagia Sophia, knowing that it also was a Byzantine church from the Roman Byzantine Empire, is that you can see remnants of it. So look up here, can you see the gold? That was where the Byzantine piece was. And now it's much more Islamic, the decoration. But there are just these layers of history in here, which is absolutely fascinating. The whole of this building would have been full of gold Byzantine decoration. And probably the, the best example of what it would have looked like is a very little church that you can go and visit, which is now a museum called the Chora Museum. And inside that jewel is a sense of what the whole of the Hagia Sophia would have looked like back in the 6th and 7th centuries. I was thinking it might be a little bit like St. Mark's Cathedral in, in, in Venice, because also that's an entire gold mosaic by yeah. Zantar. Yes, it would have been probably very, very similar. And of course, there is a massive link between St. Mark's and the Hagia Sophia and the architecture here, the Byzantine architecture, because Venice was also Roman refugees who'd gone into the lagoon. They were all part of the same empire. And actually, the Venetians viewed the Roman emperor in the east to be their emperor. And when it came to building St. Mark's and so forth, they used architects from this city, from Constantinople, to help with the design of St. Mark's, hence them looking very, very similar. This building encapsulates perfectly the three ages that Oliver's telling us about today. It was the shining beacon of the Roman Empire here in Constantinople. It served as spiritual guidance for the city for nearly 1,000 years. And after that, it became a symbol of the Ottoman takeover, the new religion that came in with Islam. And, and the huge, magnificent panels of calligraphy show that influence coming in here. And just behind Behind me is the sumptuous golden grill behind which the Sultan could very privately participate in the prayer service. After that, in the early 20th century, it became a beacon of the secularism of the New Republic. It showed that everybody was welcome. It was a museum to Istanbul's glorious past, and no one, regardless of their religion, was prevented from coming here. That has changed in recent years, but as you can see, it is still very welcoming to all.
a little pause before moving on because Oli has spotted his favourite snack in Istanbul. It certainly has. Grilled corn on the cob. And the other iconic building on this square is the Sultan Ahmed Mosque, known globally as the Blue Mosque. And I'd like to take you inside and tell you something rather interesting about the blue. The blue? Ooh, let's go see the blue. <laughs> absolutely worth the queues outside, I can assure you. It was built in the 1600s for Sultan Ahmed, but of course it's known globally as the Blue Mosque. There are around 21,000 of those blue tiles up there, and there's around 50 different sort of tulip motifs as well. When we think of tulips, we think of Holland, but actually tulips originally came from Istanbul. The other thing I find fascinating about this mosque is that French visitors came here and when they went back home to France, they talked about the Turkish blue of this mosque, which is where the name turquoise comes from. And really beautiful it is too. I really didn't know that about the origins of the word turquoise. It's amazing. It's so fascinating. When you hear it, it's kind of yeah, obvious, Turkish, isn't it? But you'd never think of it. And that stunning blue that you see everywhere. Oh, I love it. After a long, very, very cold day visiting the most historic sites of Istanbul, we have come back to our hotel, the Pera Palace, to the Orient Express Bar, because this place was built in the mid 19th century for the guests arriving on the Orient Express. So it's incredible. It's like going back to those days, and many of you will have heard of it because it's been a huge Netflix hit. Midnight at the Pera Palace, which is amazing. It shows Agatha Christie being here and Ataturk. If you've watched the Netflix series, you'll know that in the very first episode, in the big dining room, there are some British officers on one table and Ataturk and some other Turkish officers on another table. And the Brits invite him over to their table. And this is a very symbolic moment for the history of Turkey. He says, you are the guests in our country. And as such, the hospitality insists that you join my table and not the other way around. And in fact, that happened in this very bar. It did not happen in the restaurant as it's shown in the Netflix series. So we are sitting in a room where a huge moment in Turkish history happened. The moment when Turkey started to move towards founding its own new modern republic. I think even though we're British, we can drink to that. I like Ataturk's spirit in that moment. He was quite right. So we are going to celebrate with Midnight at the Pera Palace, their new signature cocktail. Oh, and in case you're into cocktails, this has got two whiskies, Johnny Walker Black Label and Kalila, which I really love, and then lemon sour and smoked honey. And there's even a fig and rosemary in it. What do you think, Ollie? It's actually really nice. It's so good, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's got a bit of sourness to it, mm. which is fantastic. Here's a toast to Ataturk. Do you know what? And Turkish hospitality. Many famous people have stayed here over the years, but probably the most famous is Agatha Christie, who apparently, in terms of books sold, is third only after the Bible and Shakespeare. So she's done pretty well. And she wrote her most famous novel, Murder on the Orient Express, here in the Pera Palace Hotel. There's another reason I wanted to come to this hotel. There's another famous author, and I'm not sure Stephanie knows this, there's another famous author called Graham Greene, who yes, she would have I heard do of. know Graham Greene, thank you. I know you know about Graham Greene, but did you know that Graham Greene's book, Travels with My Aunt... I didn't even know he'd written Travels yeah. with My Aunt. Well, Travels with My Aunt actually had a scene in the Pera Palace Hotel with Aunt Augusta and Henry Pulling, and they do complain an awful lot about the food, which is totally wrong because the food is delicious. But of course, Travels with My Aunt is very close to my heart. When we were thinking of names for this vlog, it was travel, Travels with My Aunt that came to my mind when we were thinking about it. I am not, and never will be, Oliver's aunt. I'm not your aunt, Oliver. Do not ever refer to <laughs> me as your aunt again. It's the name, it's the name. It was so good. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you are kind of an auntie for me. 
one more, yes. one more There'll reference to me as your aunt, and it will be your <laughs> last travel with your friend. Yes. Without Graham Greene, <laughs> we wouldn't have the name for our vlog, so we appreciate that, Graham. Um, Cheers. Well, to be fair, you did come up with the name, and I did not know you got it from that. Hmm. Well, that's why I want you to come here. It's been an amazing time, and thank oh. you, Stephanie, but Ooh. it's not over. It was the end. I thought, it was the end. I thought we were going in for a cheers at the end. So Stephanie thinks we're about to have a meal in the hotel, but I have a little surprise in store for you, Stephanie. Ooh. Oh, this is very curious. This is our pre-dinner aperitif, which we are having in Europe, as you know. But what is remarkable about Istanbul, apart from the fact it's a city of three ages, it's a place of two continents as well. Istanbul is built across Europe, and on the other side of the Bosphorus, we have Asia. And I want us to go and have dinner in Asia tonight. I have never, never crossed the Bosphorus into Asia. I'm I know. I'm excited we're doing that tonight. Yes, we are. And I've been to Istanbul many, many times, but I've never done that. Do you I would love that. I've never been to the Asian side either. Okay, excellent. And I think this is the time. Yes, definitely. Oliver, this is really exciting. We're going on a boat. I know, we are going to Asia. And by the way, see the red building over there? Yes. That is the, that's in Asia, and that's the hospital where Florence Nightingale served the troops. Isn't that amazing? That is absolutely incredible. Yeah. We're on we our way. It. I'm actually just amazed that we made it. We're not entirely sure where this ferry's going. <laughs> But we're going to go anyway because it goes to Asia. That's the only thing we know. Ooh, fine, let's just go I mean, to Asia. Asia's quite a big place. <laughs> I think the view is going to be amazing. Okay, let's go find a seat. It's very nice and warm on this. Oh, ferry. it's lovely. I can't tell you how happy I am. I genuinely am slightly worried as to where we're going. Should <gasps> we put that out there? I think there's a little cafe. Do you want a cup of tea whilst we're. I'll go and get us I a would. cup of tea. Yes, thank you very much. You brought me on the most exciting adventures. I cannot believe that we have just had our cocktail in Europe and about to have dinner in Asia. I mean, you brought me on some of the coldest adventures as well, <laughs> but the most exciting. Look at this. It is. It is spectacular, it's isn't it? Magnificent. Here we go. The mosques over there. Sultan Ahmet. I hope we get back this evening. I'm a little bit worried. Bye, Europe. Europe. Bye. Look at this for a view. And hopefully at the other end, there'll be a nice warming meal. That's the theory. <laughs> when will the other end be though? I mean, that's the question. Well, um, honestly, Oliver is leading the way on this and I'm worried. <laughs> so am I. And here we are. I'm jumping into Asia. Oh, you did it. <laughs> yes. I walked in, to be oh, fair. Right. I, I didn't have your you, exuberance. You were, you were far more graceful. Well, I was quite busy trying to order an Uber. Oh, OK. I was just overexcited. So I'm thinking about the food part of this We're in Asia lot. and we're going Uber to a restaurant. How cool is that? So cool. <laughs> so cool. I was nearly run over by a yeah, bus, but we found the yeah. taxi. Yay. We've got a little bit of a ride, actually. We've had a restaurant recommended by the hotel, which is about 25 minutes oh, that's north along the coast. Lovely. Yes, the main concern after the restaurant is, can we get back into Europe, into our warm, comfortable hotel? But we'll worry about that one later. I'll be honest, Ollie, I never thought we were going to see this restaurant ever. Well, it's when you asked at the ferry, he said, where do we go? And the man said, well, where is your restaurant? And you went, Asia, <laughs> we must get to Asia. Yes, that was, a, that, was a, that, was a, that was a Brit abroad moment, I have to be said. <laughs> but here we are, and this is amazing. We are literally under the bridge. Have you seen? That is the main bridge. Oh, wow. Yeah. Incredible. Well, so I think we're a lot closer to getting back to Europe. I, I think, think we've we definitely are. come the long way around. I think we are. <laughs> Let's go for it. Thank you. Hello. This is very pretty. Wow. Look at this. We are under this incredible bridge that goes all the way to the other side of the Bosphorus. Oh, my goodness. This is amazing. It's really so lovely. I'm guessing it must be down this way. I'm getting so peckish now after Oliver's just trip to anywhere in Asia to get to dinner. This is the view from our table. I'm having one of those pinch myself moments. Yeah. We've just been on this crazy trip <laughs> on this taxi to the ferry on the ferry, which seemed to go on forever. And then we've been on like a 35, 40 minute car ride. The bridge is just above us. It's insane. And the food is amazing as well. I really recommend this place. And here's my baby aubergine salad over here and your fish soup. Yeah. Which smells delicious. We, we will put the, the details of this restaurant totally random fine in, in the description. Oh, and it bread. Is insanely good. I always get very excited by the bread basket. This one doesn't disappoint. Look at the look on that face. 
It's really exciting. Look at it. It's amazing. I think this could be the highlight of your day, Stephanie. Food is always the highlight of my oh, day. Look at this place. It's so cool. It really is. It's a contrast to sort of all the other places we've been to, which have been absolutely lovely and they've been quite historic feeling. Mm. This feels like cutting edge Istanbul. We nourished the soul earlier and now we're nourishing the body. Equally important. Absolutely. You go for it, Stephanie. You're definitely having your vegetable quotient now. Mm. I'm very impressed. Stephanie looks in a little bit of state of shock. And the reason being is that she thought she was ordering a very delicate and elegant portion of sushi. Light sushi meal. And look what happened for one person. That's my plate. <laughs> Molly ordered the pasta, but um, I can't eat say? all of this in front of him. So we're going to share now. Wow. I mean, I'm not complaining, but no, that is one I'm, hell of a I'm happy. Portion. I am very very happy. And can I just say that before we go into an oblivion of sushi, sushi. I think we should say goodbye to people. Goodbye everybody. Yes. Thank you for joining us yes. in Istanbul today. It's been amazing. Thank you Oliver for planning today. Well no, thank you for Stephanie for being such great company. You've been a wonderful aunt. No, sorry, you've been a wonderful friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Here's good night and bon voyage. And to the next travels Istanbul. with my friend. Cheers.